always hallelujah Jesus you're my sustainer. You are the one that gives us peace that passes all understanding. 
You are the one that makes us, makes life make sense. You are our anchor. We trust in you. We rest in your love. In Jesus' name, we have prayed and worshipped. Amen. Are we blessed this morning? Praise God. Amen. Can we celebrate the ministry of cross worship and the entire team here? I know some of us had some difficulty coming to church. So some traffic that came from nowhere. But tell your neighbor, it's good to have you in service this morning. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. You know, a lot of times the cure for shame and some of the negative emotions we have is in the connection that God brings our way. Sometimes we are fighting certain kinds of challenges in our mind, in our hearts, in our emotions. And the solution is in a connection. But as usual, sometimes we feel it's in the spooky things um, of maybe some kind of deliverance, but God sometimes will connect you to a family, will connect you to a friendship, will connect you to a group. And that group will not be perfect because... Anyway, the day you entered that group made it imperfect because you yourself are not perfect. So, right, it won't be perfect, but we must learn to embrace our imperfections while we are still growing and learn to live life effectively even with our imperfections and learn to be happy even with our imperfections. Are you still there? Because, you know, they told us before we knew the right thing. That there is a time you will walk with God and you will be perfect in all of your ways. Well, there's nothing like sinless perfection. It's not going to happen. You can pray all the prayer you want to pray. It will not change. And no, but no, no, we are not trying to... Um, sort of approve a sinful life. But what we are trying to say here is, if you are waiting to achieve sinless perfection to be happy, that's not a goal. Because that goal, you will never achieve it. Right? And so happiness is your responsibility. And the joy of the Holy Ghost is for you. And it is not... Many of the things that we experience is not as a result of our performance, but the gift of the Spirit, even the fruit of the Spirit. The Bible talks about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, and kindness, and all that. It says, against such, there is no law. What we thought about the fruit of the Spirit was that it's something we walk out. We walk out the fruit. No, if you look at it critically, when it talks about even the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, he says, against such, there is no law. Practically, what he was saying is that we can eat of that fruit. We eat of it. It's not what we produce. That's what he means by against such, there is no law. Meaning, you can eat all of that fruit that God gives. Are you getting it? Yeah. So the, That's what I mean by against such, there is no law. There is no law concerning that dietary, that diet. Are you getting it? So, why am I here? I'm here because even though we are talking about spiritual warfare, I realize that a lot of the things we are also calling spiritual warfare is emotional warfare. It's heartbreak warfare. Because sometimes when people are falling down, it's a mixture of of devil, emotions, heartbreak, all mixed up in the move of the drums. <laughs> I know that you guys don't 
I know in church here yeah, we don't most of us here yeah, we don't have heartbreak. So oh. so you don't know what this means. But <laughs> truly speaking though <laughs> sometimes we see people are crying. It's not only ghost that is causing the person to cry too. So it means that if we have been looking critically, there are certain things that we have been seeing from the scriptures. And we have been seeing that we are really not in a battle with Satan. And that's what some, you know, I was, someone was asking a question about faith. You know, I, I, be, I believe in faith, but I believe that we had the extreme of faith movement. I was a very, I was a, well, let me say, fanatic of the faith movement. The faith movement means, you know, your faith will make you whole, you know, and, and it almost seems like you are punished for your lack of faith and you are rewarded for your huge faith. Now, the question will now be, and that's where they got it from the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where you had the different levels of faith. So now this thing is now a level thing. So if you don't have results, your level is... You need to go and bring more faith. So it's almost like faith is what we are bringing to the table. And it became so performance driven that it almost seems like which faith again does God want me to bring? I brought all that I can bring at this point in time and nothing is working. So I'm saying this because in dealing with spiritual warfare, and we'll deal, we'll deal with it in Ephesians 6, where it talks about the shield of faith, it's almost like you are, you know those generators that you have to wind, you are winding and pulling your faith to get that, then as the devil is coming, you whack him with the faith you have been generating. Right? And that leaves you in a constant performance-driven mindset because you think that is your faith that is quenching the fairy that of the enemy. And in, in, in other words, the, the whole essence of the cross is now shifted into human performance that we have described in the extreme concept of faith movement. Because what is then happening is we have taken the cross out of it all and we are now looking at it from what men can bring to the table in order to provoke God through their faith. And that's not how it works. So we have been explaining that Satan's work is to bring a crossless message, a crossless Christianity which elevates man's effort and reduces Jesus' work on the cross. Now, even though we said that we work out our salvation, the Bible still says, for it is God that worketh in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. And we are working it out not as a fear response. We are working it out from a place of, I have too much to be mediocre. You get it. There's a difference. So the faith movement is do this so, so that God can do it for you. Bring this one. Your faith is too small. Fast to bring your faith. Pray to bring your faith to the... You need strong faith. And you have put so much pressure on people to the point where they are tired, worn out in trying to impress God with their faith. And we began to talk about how everybody has the same faith. They like precious faith. Peter said it. Your faith, the faith we have is the faith of Christ in the New Testament. So, it's important to understand that the spiritual warfare we are talking about is not a warfare with Satan. It's a warfare with the thoughts and belief system, system Satan is sponsoring. And I've explained to you that if Satan can sponsor a belief system in you, and Satan uses shame, fear, and worry, and anxiety, if he can sponsor a belief system in you that 
Because he wanted to do that for me too when I was, I mean, he sponsored certain, and she has sponsored a lot, but he's a good sponsor. <laughs> but in court, if he wants to sponsor a belief system in you that you can, anything you do, you fail in, or you, you don't have the capacity to be successful in business. Once that belief system is consolidated in you. That's what we call strong. It's holding you strongly. So that belief system is holding you and it's what we call I know it's linked to psychology because it's in your self-concept. You are acting out the concept of who you think you are in your mind every day. So that concept you have about yourself, which Satan has sponsored, is influencing all your activities. It's influencing how you are responding to opportunities. It's influencing how you are anxious when they say come and present. Because how you have seen yourself is that I cannot be great. So if Satan has sponsored that belief system. That belief system, and I'll talk about it, begins to play in your mind. And which other village activity does he need? You are self-destructing with that belief system. That belief system becomes your own self-fulfilling prophecy. So that is why the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty true God to the pulling down of those belief systems. You see, you have a conscious and a subconscious mind. Are we there this morning? Okay. And you have a conscious and a subconscious, but your subconscious mind is so powerful. And I want to use this concept to explain certain things. Second Corinthians 10 for put it up. Your subconscious mind is so powerful because it has the capacity to store data more than even an encyclopedia. It has capacity. From when you were young, your subconscious is storing all the information. That's why when these people practice, um, when they hypnotize you, they go into your subconscious. Yeah, you know, to be studied psychology. So. They're going to, and you'll be shocked. How you remember that time when you were a baby, when you kicked the ball, all those things that you thought was not happening or you had forgotten. They are playing, right? And your subconscious is storing that data. Are you with me? And it has, so that's how they say it's jazz and all of that, but really there's some psychological part to that hypnosis thing. <laughs> Because it's you that start to tell them the thing, then you think that they have prophecy. So by the time you start to give, you meet an hypnotic person or those guys that play pranks, they start to do that hypnosis, tell you all, the, you tell them everything, they will not say it's prophecy. You have already told them. You revealed it to them. Right? So, your subconscious mind it's so powerful that I think I've explained, experienced this for those who have drank. I know nobody's drinking alcohol again. Yeah. Even though you are drinking, it's just light. The Lord is your strength if you are still drinking. So, the people that drink used to drink. You know the power of your subconscious. Your subconscious has Google Map. GPS system. That even though your conscious cannot even hold something properly and you just finish from a restaurant or a beer parlor, the subconscious Google Map and GPS system will drive you accurately and you will pack 
in your house without any stress. Because your subconscious has gathered information over the years around your route. So, in the same way, there are many events your subconscious, you think it has gone, it's there, it has kept it for you. But the truth is, that subconscious actually has a great influence in how you are responding to situations, how you respond to challenges, how you respond to opportunities. Listen, no, listen, no. This is powerful. That's when the Bible says, Romans 12, it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. The Bible says, receive with meekness the engrafted, a, a, the full word of God, the engrafted word of God, which is able to save, to save your soul. The Bible talks about that we are looking into the perfecting law of liberty. The perfecting law of liberty. That means James 1. Okay. Let's, let's, let's look at James 1 21. We'll come back here. James 1 20. Okay, can't come here, but I'll be reading for you today. No problem. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness. So, re receiving with meekness is not one thing you do then forget. Every day, is, that's how you receive the word of God, with meekness. Receive with meekness, the engrafted word of God is like when you are taking your capsule, engrafted for a particular solution. When it enters your body, it begins to attack those things, bacteria. The end, so as you are taking the word, it's attacking those wrong belief systems. So that's why in this church, sometimes you will not hear, oh, this thing, they just lay hands on me, I just fall down, I came back, I'm now. But what you will see is that over time, as you are hearing, you are hearing, because it takes time, whatever of thing of value takes time now. Which thing do you want to really build that will not take time? Yeah, then it's deceit. Anything that they will promise you, <laughs> oh God, that's how to know when they are about to dupe you. <laughs> Those ones that will just say 80% return on investment. From where? What, okay, if it's so sweet, why do you want me? You do it by yourself. The nothing comes that easy. Wealth, anything. So the transformation of the... So that's why you have to be careful. Because if you give yourself to wrong teaching, before we can bring... <laughs> you have to be careful what you listen to. Okay? So it's, it's the engrafted word of God is able to save your soul. As you are hearing that word, it's challenging... I don't want the word, the word. is challenging your native village belief system and thinking patterns and bringing the veil off. And you are now seeing with clarity. And nobody can deceive you again. Beyond that, you, are now, you now believe more in your future. Then you handle your challenges better. Because that's one of the things that happen to Christians with the wrong belief systems. A lot of believers or religious people are oversensitive to failure. That's not a good thing. We have shared it here. Religious people become too over... I'm not talking of people who know the gospel, but religious people become oversensitive to failure. Who told you it will not come to you? And when you are oversensitive to failure, you respond negatively to it. Then it becomes a cycle. Then we now go for deliverance. How do you overcome that way? Another person interprets failure as the stepping stone to success. Another person interprets failure as a valuable opportunity to learn. 
Another one interprets failure as James 1, count it all joy. When you go through trials and troubles, that the testing of your faith will work endurance. Are you getting what I'm saying? Patience, there's a, there's a character and tenacity that you will get out from that situation that will make you a better you, a stronger you, an effective you. So it depends on how you are seeing it. And if the belief systems that Satan can supply, if when you are going through that failure, you're, they are telling you, your faith is too small. You do not have great faith. You need to find big faith. You have not paid tight. You have just be in a mess. Because by the time you are thinking of tight, thinking of this one, you are, then the problem is still with you. So, we receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Next verse. Save your soul. You remember we said your soul is your... Tell somebody said. What did we say the soul is? The mind. Yes. Ha! Don't, don't form. The heart to feel. Yeah. Clap for Chris. <laughs> Pastor Chris. <laughs> but ye be ye doers only. But ye do but be ye doers of the word. Now, this place is where people say be a do. You you don't you don't do the word to be empowered. Is the word that empowers you to do the word. So to be a doer of the word is not that I have him, I must do it, the word. Well, let's see how you do the word. You do the word by reading the word. Did you get it? Okay. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Now, how? Move to the next verse. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, is now explaining what doer means. Doer is not your doer. Bible wants to tell you his own doer. Do you, because it's not showing here, I don't know whether we are getting... Are you with me, get friends, saints? So, if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like unto a man. So, he's talking about Meditation. Building a lifestyle of meditation. Are you hearing? My son, attend to my words. Incline thy ears to my sin. Let them not depart from thy eyes. Keep them in the midst of thy heart. For they are alive to those that find them and held unto all their flesh. So, he's talking about meditation. This book of the law, it was using it in, old, in the Old Testament. Shall not depart. Now, he now explains what it means to be a doer. He's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straight away forget what manner of man he is. So when we forget the word, we don't do the word. When we meditate on the word, we do the word. Next verse. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. It's not just any place in the scripture. There's the perfect law of liberty. The perfect law of liberty is the ministry of the New Testament. The perfect law of liberty is the ministry of Christ. The perfect law of liberty is the gospel of Christ. The gospel of grace. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power. The perfect law of liberty is the message of the cross. That's why. That's the perfect law of liberty. Why? That word perfect is to equip or to mature. In the New Testament, we mature into the manifestations of our realities. They don't push you into it. They don't anoint you into it. You grow into it. Philemon 1.6, the communication of your faith becomes effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know, that you may know. 
is quiet because he's entering. I believe so. That's why it's quiet. So you must enjoy growth. Don't don't contract or subcontract or hire a consultant for your spiritual life. It's your own. In the New Testament, we don't have such ministries available. It will only lead to your manipulation and you'll be broken hearted. So it says, whoever look into the perfecting law of liberty and continue therein, he being not a forgetful era, but a doer of the work. So the person who is not a forgetful era is the one who is a doer of the work. Because he's reminded and meditates on what he has seen in the perfect law of liberty. Hallelujah. So, so powerful. I don't want to enter that perfect law of liberty. This man shall be blessed. Tangible. We'll see the effects of the gospel in this person's life. So let's go back to 2 Corinthians 10 for we are still in spiritual warfare. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We've explained strongholds. And for the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, not carnal. We looked at Ephesians 6 verse 10. Your weapons are not carnal. Your weapons are not natural. What you think you could not, you don't have capacity to change by the weapons of your warfare that are not carnal, you see that you can be a good father. Are you hearing me? You see you can be a better husband. You see you can be a better child. You see you can be a better engineer. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yes. But mighty true God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now we now explain what the strongholds are. Next verse, casting down. These are the strongholds. The strongholds are the imaginations. Image formation in your dream that you were hanging leg like this. God jam you. That's or you had porridge in the dream. And when you had porridge, they now welcome you. Those are image formations that Satan is sponsoring. Deliverance cannot solve that one. Identity is the solution. You must understand who you are. We did it, made a post around spiritual husband too, and I dealt with that thing. When you found out that a spirit, which your own spirit is Christ's spirit, Generally, spirits can over marry. Then you now have Christ's spirit. Where did you find husband? Where can the spirit of Christ be married to another person? So, no matter the devil, no matter how he's packaged, if you like his full, you know, I, I said one where I was. Because things can look real until you, when your mind is renewed, you tackle it. You say this, you are making a fool out of yourself, Satan. It's just like the one I talked about where I was arranging things and as I'm pressing things, I was hearing one baby crying because my children had done surgery on their baby doll. 
and they only they brought out <laughs> I don't want to call it the heart. They brought out some part of the baby doll that only does the singing. The baby doll was somewhere else, then it was only the the machine of whatever that still does the singing. So me, I'm just in my room arranging my life. As I'm pressing something, I'm hearing baby crying. I checked. <laughs> Where is this? Is this a spiritual baby or what? <laughs> I calm down. I say, wait, wait first. You are pastor, lad. You know you have preached this thing. So, this thing cannot be spiritual baby. First of all, I press, press. I'm still hearing this baby. I just left. I said, whatever it is, yeah, whether spiritual baby, it has not affected me. I'm going. <laughs> I'm still moving. So. <laughs> the cry is not affecting my sleeve. I'm okay. So let me shall go to work or go wherever I'm going. I'm doing more <laughs> with my life. But afterwards, I say, they must, this thing, where we, let's find out what's going on there. And I did some excavation. And lo and behold, I saw a spiritual baby. Is it a spiritual baby? which was just some a toy that they are taking out. Now, another person will say, spiritual baby came. And if you are now looking for a child, now connect it. That work. Devil self have happy. <laughs> Glad. Thank you for that connection. <laughs> So that's how it works. To us, Paul said, there is no God like that. To us, in our own realm, all those things is baby doll, toy that they put things there. To us, we have one God. We are in him and he's in us. That's how you walk. So, the image formations that he sponsors. So don't be too, I believe dreams, God can speak through dreams, but don't pack your life around it. Because when you are awake, let him speak to you. He can speak when you are awake too now. So why are you waiting for a dream? You want to sleep in the night. You sleep. When you wake up, let God talk to you. Maybe you are growing and you have some times where he keeps, but it shouldn't be a lot of times. Because that's not his primary way that he wants to communicate to you. So, I think I've, I've, I've shared about a one that is to chase Dr. Damina with his dream. Every day, new, new, every week, he's dreaming and asking for interpretation. Every week. To the point where once decide how to take off because it's new dream to interpret. So, even your dreams, you have to be careful because he can use it, the dreams. Like I said, even your trauma can be in your dreams. Mm -hmm. So, you just package it like that because I know that I used to have certain dreams that were trauma related because I had an issue. I missed a year in school then between secondary school and university. And that was traumatic for me. So every now and again, even after I've passed exam, I've finished university. I used to still feel that I don't used to do, I would dream that I, I didn't finish one exam or something like that. It used to still come. So now you now say, I want to do. It's just a trauma, some of those trauma responses that are appearing in my dream. So I trash it. Did you hear me? I don't start building new, new doctrine around it. So you cast it down imaginations. Imaginations is a gift in Ephesians 3. The Bible says, unto him that is able to do exceedingly above what we ask or imagine. We use it positively. Your imagination is God's ability in you to prefer, to picture a preferred future without physically going there. Imagination is God's gift to you to 
dream beyond your current challenges concerning possibilities of your future. That's what you use imaginations for. Are you hearing me? And your imagination should be influenced by the word of God. They should be shaped by the word of his grace. My future is decorated by God's faithfulness. Are you hearing me? That's how you think of your... My, all the challenges in my future, God's grace has gone ahead of it to make them work for my good. Cast it down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. That's why we say the knowledge of God is important. Second Peter 1, 2, don't go there. Grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God. So we said that that word diabolical, when they say something is diabolic, I will show you where, if you joined Wednesday service, you might have found that, but I'll show you this. To be diabolical is not just, is to distort God's image and take away the cross from Christianity. Matthew 16, verse 20 or 21. Are we learning? Okay. From the time forth, from that time forth, Fought began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and of chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Next verse. And then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. I want you to do NLT. Go back to 21 and do NLT. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the priest. See who is persecuting Jesus. It's not unbelievers, in quote. It's the religious people, the elders, the priests, and the teachers of the religious law. And we share that. And that is why even to your date, the people that don't like the gospel are the religious people of the law. More than even people that have not come into the faith. The Bible says he will be killed, but on the third day he will be raised from the dead. Glory to God. But Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him. Jesus, come, let's talk because this thing you are saying is not making sense. Reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. Next verse. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. They believed Jesus as Lord, but they wanted the Lord without the cross. That's Satan's work. Crossless Christianity. Effort-based Christianity. Idolatry. A man and his power that he supplies, a man like that he gives to people to break through. That's what, that's what Satan was against. We want a Christianity that, is, that doesn't have the cross. But there's no Christianity without the cross. Crossless messages. Crossless songs and worship. Because at the cross is the exchange, the legality behind Christianity, the reason behind Christianity. That's where power is released, that's where transformation occurs. If not, what we have is self help. 
So, the rebuking of Satan, and this is where we get that word diabolical, is in the fact that Satan wanted a Christianity without the cross. A message that doesn't point people to the cross. Because in the cross, the power of God is released. You didn't hear the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us who believe, it is the power of God in action. Are you hearing me? That's where the power of God is dispensed. That's where the power of God is supplied. That's where cripples can walk. That's where blind eyes can be opened. That's where your depression can get out. That's where your sickness can be healed. It's in the power of the cross. Not in self-help messages. Not in handkerchiefs. Not in an anointing oil. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it. Christ, the wisdom and the power of God. Paul said, I commend you unto God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you, strengthen you, empower you, and to give you an inheritance among them that are sanctified. Being born again, not of a corruptible seed, but that which is incorruptible, even by the word which liveth and abideth forever. It will strengthen you with might in your inner man. That's why it says, as we behold, as in a glass, the glory, that image, we are translated. We are translated. We are transformed as we see Jesus. Weakness goes. Strength rises up on our inside. So, Let's go back to 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5 now. For the weapons of our fellow pulling down strongholds, verse 5. Casting down imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We said the obedience of Christ is the finished work of Christ. The obedience of Christ is the finished work of Christ. The, any thought that is anti the finished work of Christ, we trash it. Any thought that that is anti the finished work of Christ, we trash it. Whether it came through a dream or a prophecy, The obedience of Christ is the exchange of Christ on Calvary. The obedience of Christ via identification is your obedience. He died. When he died, you died with him. When he rose, you rose with him. We are seated together, raised us up. He didn't just say raise them up. Together. Let's say together there. And the meditation of that identity is what is or what brings the reality of your dominion. They which receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, they reign in life. They reign in life. They reign in life. How do we reign in life? Ephesians 6 verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Next verse. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the power of the devil. No. The wiles, the tricks. The strategies of the devil. For we wrestle. Another person now said, oh, but this is there. We wrestle. 
not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Well, read the next verse. Let it keep on explaining itself. Wherefore, take on take unto you the whole arm of God that you may be able to withstand, stand in the evil day, having done all to stand, not having done all to fight. Stand again, stand, 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 stand in the existing truth. It's not new truth. Stand in that truth that if any man be in Christ, is a new creature. All things are passed away, and all things are becoming, and all things are of God. Did you hear that? All things are of God. Generational causes is not of God. All things are of God. When I became born again, God entered me. All his goodness entered me. Generational causes were flushed out of me. I'm seated with him. I'm in Christ. Christ is in me. His spirit is my spirit. His grace is my grace. His power. We are joint heirs with Christ Jesus. Stand therefore, having your law is good about which you having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, one of the emotions or negative emotions that the devil uses to attack us is shame. Shame. Shame, fear, and guilt. And religious people tend to be very shameful. Why? It's the way religion plays. It's the law of Moses. Guilt. I said they did a study for, of religious people who major on performance than identity. And they realized, I've shared this before, that when a religious person Things of their weaknesses. They have higher brain activity. Do you get what I mean? So when they think of their weaknesses, their brain is moving so fast. Oh, my weakness. Oh, why me? My failure. So it's very high brain activity. When they think of their strength, low brain activity. You have this gift. You say it's humility. It's not really a gift like that. You are the righteousness of God. I'm not the righteousness of God yet. I'm trying to get there. So, what it means is their shame is written in the cycle of their brain. That's what it means. When your activity is heavy towards your weaknesses. We all have, like we shared, we all have weaknesses. We don't just let our weaknesses have us. All. All. Say, say all. All. Mm -hmm. So, So the religious person has shame and is extremely sensitive to failure because of the shame. All are working together. When they go through a challenge, they are so fast to look at their own shame and take that challenge personal. So we see that How does the enemy use shame? And why is this breastplate of righteousness an armor? The breastplate of righteousness is protecting the heart from shame and condemnation. A shameful person cannot be a bold person. A shameful person will not go for their dreams. So the response to the shame that the enemy sponsors 
is the breastplate of his righteousness. That means my breastplate against the shame of my past, the opinions of people, how people are viewing me, what people think of me, how the devil, remember John 5, 45, there is one that accuses you before the father, even Moses, whom you trust. So shame and guilt be we protect ourselves from the shame and guilt the enemy sponsors in our lives because see what happens, right? As you go through life, there will be shameful events that will occur in your life. Do we agree? Nobody has been through any shameful. Uh, I'll say that you are, you are perfect in all your ways there. <laughs> So, that's why we say life is not fair. It's childish to think that life, life is not fair. And it's, all these things, the shame, it has not only you. As long as we're a human being, shame has come to every one of us at some point. So, it's not the events in our life that shape us. It's how we respond to the events in our lives that shape us. Because all of us are having the events. But people are responding differently. And you respond differently based on the armor you have. Are you hearing? So my armor is that I'm not an event. Are you hearing what I'm saying? When God entered my life, he placed his nature in me. And that is the righteous nature. I am a righteous as Christ. And that protects my heart from every condemnation. And that's why when the Bible says in Isaiah 54, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue that rises up against you shall be condemned. This is the inheritance. It's not this is the reward. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. The weapon is the tongue that is rising up against you. The tongue of condemnation is the weapon of the enemy. That's why it means no weapon formed fashioned against you shall prosper. What is the weapon? Every tongue that says that because of this failure, there is no future. Every tongue that says because you have this weakness, there is no future. Every tongue that says look at the pattern of your past and your family is condemned. How? This is an inheritance. This is not a reward. This is an inheritance. You don't work for that one. You work for inheritance. How many people have worked for their inheritance, if you have one? But nobody works for their inheritance. <laughs> we don't work for inheritance. This is the inheritance. The inheritance of a child of God is that you have been discharged and acquainted. The inheritance of a child of God is that God has approved every dream. It may take a process, it may take a journey, but you are not defined by the person that gave birth to you or where you were born or what happened to you when you were young or what happened to you when you were small. If you entered into Christ, you became a new man with a new dream. The Bible says you are God's idea. You are, you are not hearing what I'm saying. You are God's idea. You are God's painting. You are God's artwork. You are God's image. Recreated. You were sourced from a different source now. Recreated in Christ Jesus. You were not recreated just in a womb. When you became born again, you were sourced out of Jesus. What, what you are made up of Christ. That is your DNA now. The Bible says because he has sons, he has sent the spirit of his son in you. Like I said, he didn't just say you are my son. He know they want you. He doesn't say you are my son. Now just take it. You are my son. You are my son. No. For you to be my son, I 
put what makes a son in you. I put the capacity to overcome. That's why it says, be of good cheer, little children, for you have overcome them. There is a greater one that lives in the inside of you. You have capacity to overcome challenges. You are not a weakling. You are strong. Those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will still mount up with wings like eagles. There is a capacity to maneuver through challenges. You are not an event. You are in Christ. And that's why it says, we this it a little bit. It says, they which receive the abundance of grace. They two are in the spirit. Yeah. They which receive the abundance of grace. And the gift of righteousness, they reign in life. The Bible says, if the same, it didn't say if a like kind of spirit, if a spirit that looks like God's spirit, if a similar but smaller spirit, if the same spirit, the same spirit, the same spirit that pushed out hell and came out of the grave. If the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives inside of you, he can, he can tallow, he can quicken your mortal body, he shall quicken your mortal body, he shall quicken your mindset, he shall quicken your belief systems. He can do labanatis. He shall quicken so miracles is just a foretaste. Breastplate of righteousness. He says, this is the inheritance of the servants of God. Then he now says, and their righteousness is of me. They didn't achieve their own righteousness. The reason why no tongue can prosper in their life is because their righteousness is not of themselves. So even in the Old Testament, this is Isaiah 54, last verse, it was already prophesying this. And that's why it says, Paul said, being found in him. Being found in him. I'm not found just in a degree. I'm not found in a salary. I'm not found in a suit. I'm not found in a marriage. I'm not found in a university. I'm not found in the opinions on Instagram. I'm found in him. Being found in him. Being found in him. Being chosen in him. Being kept in him. Being found in him. Not having my own righteousness, but the righteousness that is by faith in Christ Jesus. Next verse. No, no. Next verse in Ephesians 6, let's close. Krado no mahataya. Shelebro di bahaya. Thank you, Jesus. I really feel we should pray in the... And your feet short with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Another version says, your feet is short with the peace that the gospel supplies. Peace that the gospel supplies. Because when you are at peace, you make wiser decisions. When you are at peace, you take command of issues. When you are at peace, what was meant to break you will build you. When you are at peace, your struggle becomes your ministry. When you are at peace, pain turns to power. When you are at peace, the bending in your life becomes what God used to mend you into victory. Next verse. 
above all TPT in this verse I want us to pray is it okay to pray my house shall be called the house of prayer right TPT Sixteen Ephesians 6 I want us to read it if we have our own Bibles open it Ephesians 6 16 TPT in every, in every battle take faith as a wrap around shield for it is able to extinguish the blazing arrows coming at you from the evil one next verse is embrace we'll come back here embrace the power of salvation's full deliverance you have to embrace it this salvation has full deliverance not partial full deliverance translated totally from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that were against us which was contrary to us taking them out of the way and it onto its course have been spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it that word is he made a show of us ah glory to God we the believer is this the victory of Christ he made a show of us but let's look at in every battle take faith as a wrap around shield I've taught this but sometimes it's still good to go back and meditate that's where we say the shield of faith and most of the time we think of that shield of faith as we have a shield so as the devil is coming we are blocking it so a shield of faith is the one we bring to the table so we bring our faith so sometimes when because he said the shield of faith where would you able to quench the fairy darts so certain times where your faith is not good faith or strong faith or high faith only god knows who is helping us to calculate it maybe it's low faith then that's when you say, ah, this, that hit me because my faith, the shield was not high enough because you feel it's your faith. But the shield of faith there is taken from Psalm 91. It's not the shield of your faith. It's the shield of God's faithfulness. Ooh, you don't know how powerful that is. Psalm 27 verse 13 says, my heart would have fainted if I had not believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. God's faithfulness, God's faithfulness will kick out worry, anxiety. It will make you have some kind of confidence towards your future. So, the fairy that is the anxiety that the enemy is throwing at you. The worry that the enemy is throwing at you. You will not give birth. You will have a miscarriage. Your marriage will not end well. You will not have a good job. But the response is God's faithfulness. Just as Jesus was faithful to the cross, we know that God is forever faithful, being confident of this very thing, that he that began, he that, he that began a good work. So how do you quench those worries and anxieties? You quench them with the knowledge of God's faithfulness. That's how you quench the fairy that. The fairy that is don't think Nollywood. The fairy that, you can think Nollywood, but not now. The fairy that is the anxiety. You won't do well. Your future is not that powerful. You had a dream you were sinking in a swimming pool that's how your life is sinking that's what the fairy that is but you you quench it with the knowledge of God's faithfulness
and you you start to sing. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's quenching worry, quenching fears, quenching anxiety. Good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. I'm loved by you. It's who I am. 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 making all things beautiful in his time. He's like Joseph, what they meant for evil, God turned it for good. What they meant for evil, what life showed at me, I made it better. I became stronger. I became better. I became stronger. I became better. I became stronger. I became more effective. I became stronger. I became more effective. I became more effective. I became stronger all of the way. Jesus, you are I will satisfy you. Just a word coming out and show you my salvation. I will decorate your days with my mercy. I will shower you with my love. My goodness shall be seen in your life. My mercies will be seen in your life. My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. I'm a believer, redeemed and believed. I'm loved, loved by the Father. That's enough. Is that enough? Oh, 
make make that declaration. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your faithfulness. We know and we know that's what Paul said. And we know and we know that all things work together for our good. We are chosen, not forsaken. We are blessed beyond measure. Life is not happening to us. Life is happening for us because God is for us. If you believe it, shout glory. glory. Shout glory. glory.